Hey guys, thanks for joining us for another tutorial. This week we are welcoming back the hit film legend that is Simon Jones, and he's going to be showing you how he created some of the visual effects for Atomic Productions' latest short film, The Splinter Cell. Let's jump into the software and take a look at how it works. When Atomic Productions put out a new short film, you know it's going to be something special. That's why I pretty much say yes whenever they ask me to jump on board with them. My name's Simon Jones and today I'm slipping the old night vision goggles back on to take you through one of the key shots I provided for the Splinter Cell Part 2. Well boys, here we go. Here's the shot. There's two distinct parts to the visual effects and I'm going to cover both of them in this tutorial. Now the obvious one is the night vision look, which includes the highlighting of the actors. What's hopefully less obvious is that this entire shot is fabricated from the ground up, created inside HitFilm Pro, and it was never actually filmed. Let's break it apart. I start off with three elements, this still image and these two green screen clips. Step one is to convert the still image into a projected 3D shot. Think of how a real life projector will take an image and display it on any kind of surface that you point it at. In HitFilm, the concept is largely the same. I'm projecting the image onto carefully positioned 3D planes. This turns the image into a 3D scene with real depth. Step two is some good old fashioned green screen work, isolating both of the actors. Once that's done, they can then be dropped into place anywhere inside that 3D scene. Artificial shadows and some foreground props were used to increase the sense of this being a real shot. Because the scene then existed in 3D, it's possible to run lights through it. I moved a green light through a blacked out version of the scene, and this was then composited back onto the main shot, creating the impression of the night vision scan. The colour cycle effect was then used on the actors to create the heat map appearance, timed to only appear after they were scanned by the night vision. Finally, the entire shot was run through a bunch of grading filters to give it the main night vision look. First up, I'm going to make a new 1080p composite shot, and into this I will drop that image. Then I'll scale the image down until it's just a touch wider than the frame, and this is going to be the starting point for our shot. I'm going to call the image Source. Now I need to start constructing my 3D scene. From the new menu I'll create a new plane, set to 3000 by 3000 and call it Surface. I've gone for a pretty high resolution here and that's because we're going to be projecting onto it. Having the plane be higher resolution means we'll get better results. It doesn't really matter what colour the plane is, so I'll just hit OK. In the effects menu, I will now find the projector effect and add it to the plane, followed by the grid effect. I'll now convert both of these layers on the timeline to be 3D. The camera that has now appeared I'll rename to primary, and then I'll hit Ctrl D to duplicate it. The duplicate I will rename to projector. I'll drag the projector down so it sits just above the image. Okay, this is all part of the setup for the projector, so bear with me. I'm now going to turn off the image, leaving just the grid pattern on white. In the surface layer, I'll go into the projector settings. There aren't that many settings in here, but they can take a moment to wrap your head around nonetheless. Before I start messing with the projector, I'm going to change the grid effects blend mode to normal. This means that we'll be able to see the projection underneath the grid, which is then composited on top of it. So, the projection from setting refers to what we are actually going to be projecting. Imagine it to be the slide that you're slotting into your projector. It's what we're going to see. I'll select the source image here. The camera setting determines the projector's point of view. If it were a real projector, think of this like the light shining through the slide. I'm going to choose my projector camera, which is currently staring right at the source image. So far so good. Now to position this plane so that it can be our new 3D floor. I'll duplicate the source layer, set the duplicate back to 2D, and rename it to Reference. This is simply so that I can see the image for reference without it interfering with the 3D scene. It's important here to realise that what we're doing is creating an approximation of this scene. There's no need to create a completely accurate and realistic recreation of the space. If I wanted that, I wouldn't be doing it using planes inside HitFilm, and would instead go into a dedicated 3D modelling package. 
I'll start by rotating the x-axis, using the grid to start aligning the plane by eye along the floor in the photo. I'll need to adjust the z and y rotation slightly as well. This is something of a trial and error process, which again highlights how this is an approximation rather than a simulation, but for this particular shot, it's everything that we need. Once I'm happy with the floor, I'll move on to other geometry. The back wall is a good next step, so I'm going to duplicate the floor, rename it, and then adjust the plane's rotation to match the back wall. Now this is where the grid becomes especially useful. It's important for the back wall to be positioned correctly relative to the floor and the camera, and the easy way to do this is to move the wall plane back in space, watching how the grids intersect with each other. When the grid intersection matches the intersection point of the wall and the floor in the photo, then we're good to go. I'll do the left wall now. Same general tactic, duplicating the plane, rotating it as required, then sliding it into position and using the grid intersections as reference for the correct placement. If I hold down the Alt key and click and drag on the back wall, I can orbit the camera around. You can see how the left side of the space is now modelled simply in 3D space, with the image projected onto the floor, the left wall and the back wall. It all looks a bit crazy on the right here because we haven't added any geometry there. Remember that it's always the camera on the highest layer of the timeline that is controlled in the viewer, which means we're altering our primary camera here. The projector camera remains static, pointing straight at the source layer. Building up the scene is a matter of adding and positioning planes as required by your project image. The ceiling here is easy. It's a direct duplicate of the floor raised up into position. Some foreground elements like the steel girder will need additional masking work to match their shape. First, get your projection layer into position, and then you can use the pen tool to draw the shape as required around the object, making sure that you leave enough room top and bottom outside of the frame so that you can move the camera around. Now in this particular image, something is now very apparent. Those diagonal wooden beams are causing all kinds of visual glitches. Even if I add a plane for each beam, it still doesn't work because as soon as the camera moves, it reveals the original version of the beam in the image, which becomes increasingly warped as it's projected onto incorrect 3D planes. This is because the foreground wooden beam is being projected onto the surfaces intended for the floor and walls. It immediately gives the game away. If you're sourcing and taking photographs for use in a projected scene like this, Always try to avoid foreground elements such as this, which cross over a wide area of varying perspective depth. It's better to add this stuff in through compositing later, rather than having to deal with it in the original source. In this case, because I was creating the shot for Atomic and had to stick with the provided material, I went for Plan B, which is painting out the tricky items. You can use your preferred image editor for this, although you'll want to have a clone stamp tool available. Here you can see I'm cloning one part of the image to clean up another part. This is painstaking and pretty tedious work, hence it's best avoided if possible, but the end result was this clean version of the shot, without the foreground wooden beams. So back in HitFilm, I'll add the clean version of the image, and copy the transform position and scale properties from the original source layer, and then paste them onto the same properties on the clean version so that they match completely. In the timeline search box, I'll search for projection, then flick all of the settings over to the new clean version. Optionally, you can add the beams back in as new layers if you want to. So how much additional detail you put in now is up to you and the needs of the shot and your patience. I'm going to skip forward to the completed scene so that we can focus on the next element, getting the actors in. I'm not going to cover green screening in this tutorial because there's already at least 9,000 tutorials on that subject. All I will say is to make sure that you do your keying and masking in dedicated composite shots for each actor. That way all the processing is held within the composite shot, and once you've got it nailed you can start proxying those shots so that from that point onwards they'll perform at maximum speed. So here I am with the keyed actors. I can now drop those composite shots into the scene. I'll set the layer to 3D plane, note how his feet have now disappeared into the floor. We can use that to position him accurately in 3D space. First I'm going to adjust the layer's anchor point so that it sits on the actor's feet. This will make positioning easier. I'll move him back down until he hits the floor, 
Right now, he's a bit of a giant, so I'll shrink him down. Because I move the anchor point, he shrinks down relative to his feet position, which is really handy. Depending on how you set up your scene, you can even position your composited actors behind some of the scenery. For this shot, I position them behind layers that I was projecting onto, which then really helps to sell the illusion of everything being in a real deep 3D space. Bear in mind when working with projected sets like this that it's still primarily an illusion, so don't get too ambitious with your camera moves. Subtle, small motion stuff works fine, but it's not the same as having a properly modelled and textured 3D scene. So it's time to get rid of the grids now that we don't need them anymore. In the timeline search, I'll search for grid, and then switch them all off. I won't bother to delete them at this point, just in case I want them back on for reference at another time. An interesting aspect of having a projected space is that you can apply different lighting effects to it. For example, let's give this guy a shadow. First, I'll set the actor layer to cast shadows in material properties, then I'll search for illuminated and turn it off for all of the layers. I want this light casting a shadow, but not changing the actual lighting in the shot. I can now position the light to roughly match the real lighting in the photograph. The actor will then cast his shadow realistically onto the floor or the walls, making it look like he's really part of the scene. So once I had the core of the shot finished, I could now create the scan version. For this I duplicated the entire composite shot, naming the duplicate scan. In the scan version, I searched for illuminated and turned it back on for all the layers. I'll turn off the shadow light as we won't be using it. Instead, I'm going to add a new light and set it to be bright green. By carefully setting the fall off distance, I can use this light to illuminate only part of the set. This light can then be animated to move through the scene from foreground to background, casting green light as it goes. Because this is the only light in the scene, anything not lit by the green light remains completely dark. Back in the main composite shot, I can now add the scan composite shot as a new layer. This layer I set to add blend mode, which removes the black but retains the illuminated green. This takes on the appearance of an overlay scan on top of the original shot. I used the TV damage effect to add some distortion to this scan layer so that it didn't appear too clean. It's a good idea again to create a proxy version of the scan in order to speed up your rendering. Once the hard work of creating the projected scene is complete, setting up cool lighting effects like this is actually surprisingly simple. One thing to bear in mind is that if you change the position of anything in the main composite shot, including the camera, you will then need to replicate that over in the scan version, otherwise they'll get out of sync and look super weird. That's why you want to get your shot as final as possible before then doing the scan. The last component of the scan was the heat map highlighting of the actors. Because they were green screened, it was actually really easy to apply grading only to them without affecting anything else. I used the color cycle effect because it makes this kind of thing really easy. All I needed to do was set the alpha to original so that it wasn't just taken on the whole layer but was only the green screened area. And then I selected the hue cycle preset. And that was about all there was to it. Having the effect turn on was a simple matter of keyframing the blend with original property, timed with the movement of the scan. So the final part of the Splinter Cell 2 shot was the night vision look. For this I created a new composite shot containing the main shot. And to this I added a grade layer and started adding effects. First I add the curves effect because you're not allowed to work on a video without using curves. I used it to increase contrast and darken the shot as well as then suppressing the red channel. The result of lowering the red channel is to make the shot look more green overall. I then use the scan lines effect. Some of this detail is lost on YouTube, but it gives the shot a nice bit of extra texture. I increase the frequency to make it more subtle. Film grain was used to make the shot look less digital. Looking at the finished film, I actually rather wish I'd done a bit more in this regard. And finally, I use cine style to boost up the look boosting exposure and adjusting the colour until I ended up with something that looked good. What's it look like? A messy way out. And that's the creation of the Splinter Cell 2 night vision shots. It's an unusual combination of techniques which can be reapplied to all kinds of different scenarios. If you make use of them in your own projects, be sure to let us know. In the meantime, many thanks for watching, and I'll see you all soon.
Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, please subscribe and hit that notification bell. We've got new videos coming out every Thursday. We'll see you next week.